Hello and welcome. This is Mr. Wagner and this is Principles of Macroeconomics, Chapter 1. This chapter focuses on four basic ideas. What's the definition of economics and its importance? The difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics? How economists use theories and models to better understand economic issues? and how to organize economy. So we'll have an overview of the different economic systems. Uh, the first idea is what is economics and why it is important. Economics is the study of how humans make decisions in the face of scarcity. Scarcity means the human wants for goods, services, and resources exceed what is available. So basically the human wants are unlimited and the resources are limited, hence scarcity. Uh, the FRED website has a whole plethora of data that could be gleaned for economic research, and it discusses domestic and international economic and social variables over time, and it could be used later on in this course. The current economic landscape has been totally transformed by the use of social media. Consumers can order goods or services through their cell phone, tablet, or computers pretty much instantaneously, while the producers of goods and services have excellent logistical customer resource management systems that allow for efficient delivery of the good and service. This is unparalleled from times before. Scarcity is a constant theme in economics. Homeless people are a reminder of how scarce resources can impact society. In this case, the resource is affordable housing. People trapped in low wage service or manufacturing types of jobs usually do not make the kind of money needed to Buy, buy a home or find adequate housing. Adam Smith is considered one of the forefathers of the idea of economics. The Wealth of Nations, his book written in 1776, outlines the idea that labor could be divided into discrete tasks. Also, his book describes how the upper layer of society impact all the layers beneath it in terms of socioeconomic uh, benefit. Specialization and division of labor is a phenomenon that occurred in 1850 around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Assembly lines were created. Uh, workers were focused on a handful or singular task and the uh, production of the product would move itself through the assembly line. Uh, this is really kind of an outmoded uh, form of labor division that's been transformed by the introduction of artificial intelligence and robotics. And so labor has actually become a great deal more specialized, especially in the areas of uh, technology. Why does the division of labor increase production? Dividing and subdividing tasks with producing a good or service can produce a greater quantity of output. Specialization, basically each worker works in an area where they're best suited for that particular task. And specialization allows businesses the advantage of economies of scale, which means they can produce more goods as the level of production increases and the average cost of each individual unit declines as a result. The difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics is concerned with households and firms. Macroeconomics is concerned with the national economy. So we can talk about GDP growth, employment, inflation, and trade balances. 
as a macro view of what's going on in an economy in any given nation. You might want to look at these for the test. Monetary policy is basically the level of interest rates and availability of credit and the extent of borrowing. However, that's determined by a nation's uh, central bank. In our case, it is the Federal Reserve Bank. In Europe's case, it's the European Central Bank. And it also impacts monetary supply. Fiscal policy is concerned with government involvement in spending and taxes. And this is usually determined by a nation's legislative body. John Maynard Keynes was an influential economist in the 1920s and 30s. Keynes thought that economic teaches you how to think as opposed to what to think. He also was a proponent that government is the driver of economies within nations. Economic theories and models. Theories are basically a representation of two or more variables and how they interact with each other. What economists do is they use models to test these theories. Uh, but for this course, we'll use terms of model and theory interchangeably. The circular flow diagram on this page shows how households and firms interact with each other in terms of goods and services. Goods and services and wages and salaries you know, flow from firms, basically service providers or producers, to ho households that are consumers, and in turn, household, you know, households provide labor services and they are consuming the products you know, created by the firms. How to organize economies and overview of economic systems. There's three of these. Uh, there's a traditional economy, which is typically an agrarian economy. It's the oldest known system, still used in South America, Africa, and Asia. Occupations tend to stay in the family, which means you're dealing with uh, situations like blacksmiths. Your dad was a blacksmith, you're a blacksmith, and several generations back, your family was a generation of blacksmiths. Uh, what you produce is what you consume. That's really more toward the agrarian side rather than the uh, crafts or trades. Uh, little economic progress or development uh, because there's not a free flow exchange of ideas typically. The command economy is basically the government dictating all the rules and regulations and effectively the rules of engagement of how consumers and producers interact with each other. First off, the government will decide what's going to be provided in the way of goods and services. The government also will decide how it's being produced and will set wages for workers. And the government will provide things like health care and education for free. Okay, examples of the command economy are, you know, like the ancients, Egypt, ancient Egypt, uh, medieval manor life where feudalism was the order of the day and you had the nobles and people were you know, tied to the property, feudalism, communism, uh, kind of a system that basically the, it's a command economy. Government dictates pretty much how everything runs. Right now, that's probably exhibited mostly in North Korea and Cuba. And then finally, we have a market economy where decisions are decentralized. And this is what we call a free market economy. Uh, market interaction between buyers and sellers is a, creates the combination of a demand and supply, which are dynamic. Private enterprise is where individuals or groups of individuals operate the means of production in terms of resources and business. And probably the most archetypical example of that would be the New York Stock Exchange, the free flow of ideas. Uh, a note on the last several slides, you might want to know what the three different types of economies are. <laughs> the real world, 
most economies are actually mixed. And so they may have elements of command traditional market systems. Uh, we are positioned to be more of a market type of economy. However, we have elements of command and traditional uh, in the econ mixed entity economy as well. Europe and Latin America, while, have, they, while they have a market orientation, a greater deal of uh, government involvement occurs. For example, uh, the postal telegraph and telephone system of, or let's say the, the transport, yeah, rail transportation or airlines, uh, they're very typically owned or heavily subsidized by the government. And so they pretty much control the infrastructure. China and Russia, they've become more market oriented over the years. However, they are still closer to the command economy at the end of the spectrum. Regulations are essentially the rules of engagement by which uh, participants in the markets uh, play by. Uh, regulations always define the rules of the game and the economy. Uh, the more regulated you are, the more command economy is in place. Uh, the less regulated you are, the more free market economy is in place. So if you hear a country or let's say in the United States, we are deregulating pharma, we're deregulating airlines, we're deregulating telephony. Uh, what that allows is for free market forces to uh, play a role in the process, uh, usually generating a lot more innovation in these particular industries. Uh, whereas uh, a heavily regulated economy, uh, will have an underground or black market economy, you know, that's basically shadowing the, the rest of the economy. However, the buyers and sellers do not you know, participate without any approval from the government. A recent phenomenon is the rise of globalization. These are definitions you probably want to know for the test. In particular, you know, globalization. Exports, these are goods and services uh, sent out from within a country to buy buyers in another country. Imports is, are what we bring in to the country and they're sold domestically. The GDP is basically a measurement of the total size of production in any given economy. And so if uh, GDP is growing at a certain rate, we are said to be in, let's say, a uh, Hot, you know, fast growth economy. Typically, the average for America would be somewhere between two or three percent. Uh, China's, you know, used to be seven percent. Of course, with the advent of the co you know, the COVID nineteen virus, really this is all up in the air and up for grabs. So nobody's producing at a particularly high rate, and you would probably expect to see. Uh, lackluster GDP numbers from just about everybody at this point. The global economy is made up of countries that basically focus their energies on where they can do best in terms of production, and then they trade with other nations uh, that particular good in exchange for things that other countries will be able to create at a cheaper cost. In, you know, in their system. So the discussion question is, what examples of products and services in the modern economy? What are the examples of products and goods and services in the modern economy that typically you know, transfer between nations? And how has this co uh, contributed to globalization? So let's say the shipping industry is a pretty obvious one. You see the ship with all the containers on it. Uh, the transport of goods is certainly part of the globalization process. Uh, it's not just shipping, but there's also rail and airlines, depending on where it's going. So these are things to consider. And that concludes Chapter 1.